Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily, I'm Lauren Izo. And coming up in this edition. Israel is just days into a lockdown and no one seems to be listening to the rules. How could it affect Israel's COVID-19 infection rate? And what's behind Donald Trump's new Middle East peace push? We'll speak to one of the president's most trusted advisors. Then, drive-in high holiday services. We'll take you all the way to Canada to show how one Jewish community rang in the new year. Over the weekend, Jewish Israelis celebrated Rosh Hashanah, or the Jewish New Year. But the holiday obviously looked quite different than in the past, with the country entering a three-week lockdown to curb the COVID-19 infection rate. While many observed the holiday at home, some Israelis, unhappy with the situation, defied the rules to make their point. ILTV correspondent Nitney Manson joins us with the update. Nitney, what is going on? Thanks, Lauren. Um, that's right. Israel is just days into a three-week lockdown, the second of its kind over the worsening health crisis. Uh, with fewer tests carried out over the Jewish holiday, infection rates are down, but the percentage of positive tests continue to rise. On Sunday, 2,565 new cases were recorded and no new deaths. There are also 170 Israelis on ventilators. Meanwhile, though, many protested on the lockdown, saying it was unfairly targeting small businesses, while places of worship remained open for the holiday. On Saturday alone, police handed out hundreds of fines to people who were violating the rules of the lockdown. One Jaffa restaurant remained open while publishing a prayer schedule on its social media page. Tel Avivians also took to the beach on Saturday for what they called a protest, which is allowed under the restrictions. זה מתסכל, זה מכעיס, זה באמת אפילו פוגע בי. יש רופאים ואחיות שרואים בזה יריקה בפרצוף שלהם, צריך לדעת את זה. כרגע אנחנו נמצאים במצב שבו אנחנו צריכים לגלות אזרחות באמת בריאה ואחראית, ואנחנו יכולים לעשות את זה. In Jerusalem, many demonstrated against the situation as well. In response, Israel's COVID-19 cabinet is expected to meet tomorrow to discuss tightening the restrictions. Now back to you. You can say a lot of things about the president of the United States, Donald Trump, but you can't deny that he has done a lot in his four years as president for Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. The pair appear to be thick as thieves, and while Israel is no closer to peace with the Palestinians, Trump and Netanyahu have managed to broker normalization agreements with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. And according to Trump, there are more on the way. He released this clip last week on his social media. They said it couldn't be done, but President Trump did it. The first Middle East peace agreement in decades. President Trump brought once bitter enemies, Israel, Bahrain, and the UAE together to make peace. I am grateful to you, President Trump, for your decisive leadership. President Trump nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Leadership that makes the world safer. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. It is my pleasure to be joined now by Dr. Sebastian Gorka. He is a member of Trump's National Security Education Board and also the host of the podcast, America First. Thank you, sir, for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, during Trump's campaign and in the beginning of his presidency, he spoke about, you know, making the deal of the century, peace between the Arabs and uh, the Israelis, the Palestinians and the Israelis. Now he has brokered peace with Bahrain and the UAE, but peace with the Palestinians might be further away than ever. Do you think that Trump might be alienating the Palestinians? Has he given up on that deal? If not, what is he currently doing to work towards it? Well, to be absolutely blunt, when I was in the White House at the beginning of the administration, um, it was clear to me that the president's son-in-law, Jared, and uh, his key negotiator, key negotiator uh, Jason Greenblatt, wanted to start from scratch. They wanted to listen to all the parties. They wanted to act in good faith and to ascertain whether a deal could be done with everyone. Certain of us who had served in government before, who had worked in the Middle East, who had national security backgrounds, tried to disabuse them of the belief that the Palestinians are acting in good faith. But to their credit, they said, look, we, we have to find out for ourselves. 
And as a result, Jason and Jared traveled the region. They spent several years uh, ascertaining the facts on the ground. And finally, uh, as of uh, last week, uh, the administration has come to the realization that the Palestinians don't want peace. They, they want Israel to be destroyed. They want to, to run Israelis uh, into the sea. And they're not interested in, in any kind of uh, peace that recognize, rec recognizes the state of Israel. So that's why they've taken a different tack. And that's why they've started with UAE and Bahrain. But there are at least another six countries that will join these peace accords, the Abraham Accords. And I think Saudi Arabia will be one of them. So it's the Palestinians' own decision not to want peace because they don't believe in peace. Does the Trump administration have direct contact with the Palestinians right now? I don't know what the situation right now is, but they did at the beginning of the administration, absolutely, after last week's uh, historic uh, signing of the accords. I'm sure the Palestinians are more interested in seeing rockets fly into Tel Aviv than anything else. So at the moment, I have no idea, but, you know, the, uh, the, say, the same reality stands. The Palestinians do not act in good faith, and they do not wish to have a peace which recognizes Israel. In that case, we just move on. But you're saying the ultimate goal of the Abraham Accords is ultimately peace between the Israelis and Palestinians, correct? No. No. The ultimate reality of the Abraham Accords is to have a peace which is realistic with those who want peace, period. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gorka, Trump told Fox News last week that he has absolutely no problem selling um, the F-35 fighter jet to the UAE. But Netanyahu has opposed this, you know, saying it wasn't part of the deal. What exactly is going on here? Did Netanyahu, in fact, agree to it? And will they get these planes and in what time frame? Uh, you'd have to ask Bibi himself or, or his members of his cabinet or his defense minister. I, I highly, highly doubt that the Abraham Accords had any uh, details on who would get what arms deals. So I, I think there might be a bit of miscommunication. But if the UAE or anybody else has shown good faith, which so far two nations have, along with Israel, then the obstacles to their uh, acquiring of uh, modern military equipment from the United States should have been lessened. So uh, with regards to what Bibi does or doesn't want, you'd have to ask his, his administration. Right. And, um, of course, following the signing of those two deals last week, like you mentioned, there has been talk from several countries uh, about, you know, being next to normalize ties with Israel. Um, who could be next? Can you give us some insight? I, I, now that the president's reappointed me to a position in the administration, it would be uh, inappropriate of me to indicate uh, any knowledge of who would be next. Or all, all I will say, because this has been commented already, that the, the, the decisions already by Bahrain and UAE um, must have occurred with at least the tacit acquiescence of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which in and of itself is a huge, huge success for the president and for his negotiating team. So uh, many nations between six and eight are to follow, but the, the big prize is when the kingdom agrees as well. And at that point, the Palestinians will be very, very lonely. Uh, I do want to touch on the current uh, election campaign. You know, these normalization deals are somewhat political gifts given by Trump to Netanyahu, but also just ahead of his own presidential election. In fact, you know, Trump reached out to his Jewish voters in a Rosh Hashanah greeting, reminding them what he's done for their country, Israel, and asking for their vote. Obviously, you know, not all American Jews are Israeli, and many don't feel connected to the country at all. Does he really believe that every Jew is loyal to Israel? And what is he doing to, you know, reach out to other Jewish voters other than brokering deals for Israel? Well, he's just created a, a Jewish Americans for Trump um, coalition. A friend of mine, Boris Epstein, is one of the co-chairs. Uh, and what's happening on the ground here in America is fascinating. So we know the Orthodox community in 2016 was more than 90 percent voting in favor of the president, and they, and they still have his back. 
But what's really interesting is when it comes to the secular Jewish community here in America, we've seen a, a sizable increase in the presence popularity. Some say a, a swing of at least 20 to perhaps 30 percent. And, and that is only natural because we have seen a, a rise in anti-Semitism across the nation, especially in Democrat strongholds like New York. And we've seen uh, institutional anti-Semitism become ingrained inside the Democrat Party. As long as you have people like Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who are proud supporters of the anti-Semitic uh, BDS movement, who tweet about uh, Israel being, quote-unquote, an evil nation that has hypnotized the West, then the Democrat Party does nothing about it. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, refuses to censure her Democrat uh, members like uh, Rashida Tlaib or Ilhan Omar, then, then we have, uh, sadly, uh, an increase in anti-Semitism at the heart of the Democrat Party. So more and more people supporting President Trump from our Jewish uh, community here is a very, very welcome result and also a very understandable result, given that he is the most pro-Israeli, pro-Jewish president we've had since night. Democrat Party have become the home of institutionalized anti-Semitism in this country. Well, we will all be watching in November to see what happens in this really interesting election. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Well, another country has announced its embassy will move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and by the end of the year. Honduras president writing on Twitter, we hope to take this historic step before the end of the year as long as the pandemic allows it. Israel currently has no embassy in Honduras, but opened a diplomatic office there last month. This is only the third country to move its embassy to Jerusalem, following the U.S. and Guatemala. Rob Geist Pinfold is a Middle East expert from Hebrew University, and he joins us now. Thank you, Dr. Geist Pinfold, for joining us. My pleasure. Rob, is this again the work of Donald Trump? Are all these announcements, you know, one last push before the November elections? Obviously, this embassy move has political, not only geographical implications. Well, Lauren, the peace deals and the opening of these embassies, well, sorry, that, that more, more, more accurately, they're moving to Jerusalem is definitely not a spontaneous event. This is uh, all about American pressure, uh, particularly behind the scenes. There's been a lot of contact between Israel and, and these Arab world countries like, you know, for example, the UAE for a long time. But it's uh, actually the Americans that are bringing it out into the public view uh, and are making it official because Trump needs to look like a statesman. The elections are coming up in November. Uh, uh, obviously, COVID-19 has devastated America. Uh, Trump continues to polarize domestic opinion. So what he really needs is something uh, cross-party, something non-partisan to show his image of uh, that he's a, that, to show to the American people that he's a leader in world affairs. Well, Trump said that um, Serbia and Kosovo would be next, but uh, still, so far, Honduras is only the third country to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital officially. Are these countries seen by the rest of the world as maybe taking a side in the conflict by moving their embassy to Jerusalem? It's definitely a paradigm shift. Uh, in the past, obviously, uh, a lot of countries have their embassies in Israel and recognize Israel, but their, their embassies are normally traditionally based in Tel Aviv. Uh, that is a political decision uh, based on the understanding that if the Israelis want to have Jerusalem recognized as their capital, they have to come uh, to an understanding with the Palestinians. This remains the stance, for example, uh, of, uh, you know, barring uh, Serbia and Kosovo, as we're discussing now, uh, all, almost all of Europe uh, and most of the world, that if Israel wants to have uh, Jerusalem recognized, it has, to move, it has to move towards a peace deal with the Palestinians. The fact that these countries uh, are, are now changing tack and giving Israel uh, this diplomatic victory, with the United States obviously being the trailblazers, is a clear shift uh, in global precedence and in global politics. Trump also mentioned recently that, you know, there's a ton of countries that are waiting to sign normalization agreements with Israel following uh, Bahrain and the UAE. Who do you think could be next? Well, there's been a lot of talk uh, about Sudan. Obviously, we're hearing mixed signals about this because uh, it was leaked that Sudan was about to... Um, 
was about to ink a deal with Israel, but then the Sudan spokesman who had who had leaked this was then subsequently fired. But then right. Sudan has been out again in the news recently. So if I had to put my money in any country being next, it would be Sudan. Obviously, Saudi Arabia is the big prize that Israel really wants, but there are ongoing discussions in the kingdom. Uh, the opinion is divided. Uh, within the kingdom, within decision makers, about whether to recognise Israel now or whether the, it's it's whether it's necessary to wait until a deal with the Palestinians has been concluded, which is the traditional Saudi policy. Right, and you know we all saw that Netanyahu was in Washington last week signing those deals, and as he's brokering these deals abroad, the situation at home seems to be getting worse. Is he trying to create some sort of a distraction? Oh, absolutely. Netanyahu was under massive pressure and promised to annex large parts of the West Bank, at least 30% of the West Bank. Uh, we now uh, understand that that is not going to happen any time in the near future as a direct result of these peace deals uh, with the UAE uh, and, and with Bahrain. Uh, one, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the promises that Israel was forced to make was that it won't annex parts of the West Bank in the near uh, future. So Netanyahu really has to secure his right flank, and he's doing so by uh, by basically trying to project this image that he is a global statesman, that he is, uh, you know, in a different league uh, to Israel's opposition figures. Uh, and, and anything like a peace deal with Arab countries is a cross-party consensus within Israel. Everyone agrees it's a good thing, whether they like Netanyahu or not. And as we said before, it also helps Trump, because uh, both uh, Netanyahu and Trump want to distract uh, and, and play down how they've handled the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which, to be honest with you, compared to these peace deals, is a subject of intense domestic criticism within Israel. Netanyahu has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. I'm curious whether or not you think he's actually going to win that prize and what it would mean for him. Uh, I think it's very unlikely. Uh, obviously, Trump and Netanyahu uh, uh, are both uh, supposedly in the running for a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, but I, I would bet money that neither of those are going to receive them. I mean, even though Israel has conducted uh, and made great strides in Middle Eastern diplomacy lately, with these peace agreements, uh, as I say, uh, which have basically happened because of American pressure and American lobbying, it's not the uh, end of conflict uh, deal that many people in Israel are hoping for with the Palestinians. And in short, when there's no agreement with the Palestinians, the chances of there being a real diplomatic breakthrough and a no peace prize for either Trump or Netanyahu are pretty slim. All right, of course, we will have to wait and see how the situation unfolds. Dr. Rob geis Pinfold, thank you as always for your insight. Thanks. Moving on now, two Hezbollah operatives have been sentenced today to life in prison for a deadly attack on Israeli tourists. The men were convicted in a Bulgarian court for blowing up a tour bus in 2012 in Burgas, killing five Israelis and injuring 35. The ruling leaving families of the victims unsatisfied as it did not include Hezbollah as a whole in its charges. The two men were tried in absentia over the attack and their whereabouts are not currently known. Ами по-скоро не, според мен, тъй като реално това е една декларативна присъда, която няма да бъде изпълнена, нито по отношение на наказанието, което е определено, нито по отношение на гражданските искови, които бяха уважени от съда в голям размер. Meanwhile, the Jerusalem District Court has finally ruled today to extradite suspected sex offender Malka Leifer back to her native Australia, where she is wanted on 74 charges of sexually abusing and raping minors. The case has been overshadowed by alleged political interference with members of the ultra-Orthodox community in places of power, ruling that she is mentally unfit for extradition. Although she can still appeal the decision with the Supreme Court, this is a huge milestone for the fight against sexual violence in Israel. Still shocked to actually uh, digest what we've just heard. Malka Leifer is going to be extradited to Australia after well over 10 years that she was assisted in escaping Australia by the Adas Israel School despite all the assistance she's received by the ultra-Orthodox community or many in the ultra-Orthodox community here in Israel. She's on her way to Australia very shortly. Today's decision is an important decision for the rule of law, 
for international cooperation, and most importantly, to the victims of manga lifers' crimes. We are very pleased with today's decision, and we look forward to the continued cooperation between Israel and Australia. Well, a female Jewish icon, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, has died at the age of 87. As Jews in the United States sat down over the weekend to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, news broke that Ginsburg, the first female Jewish member of the Supreme Court, passed away. An irreplaceable champion for women's rights. There is a saying in Judaism that those who die on the Jewish New Year are considered righteous, or tzaddik in Hebrew, and she is definitely in that category. And on another holiday-related note, because I'm sure there haven't been enough of those, according to the Hebrew calendar, Rosh Hashanah brings us into the year 5781. So in honor of the beginning of a new year full of births, deaths, celebrations, and other significant life events, ILTV's Hannah Rifkin takes us back on a look at some of the highlights that marked 5780. Well, it's that time of year again, the Israel Central Bureau of Statistics recently publishing its annual data report. With Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year having just taken place, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, just ahead of us, and not to mention new COVID regulations. But looking back at the year gone by, some interesting trends come into focus. First off, since last Rosh Hashanah, Israel's population increased by 150,000 people, or 1.6%, slightly less impressive than last year's 2.1% growth. Though this number still includes 170,000 live births right here in the Holy Land, 20,000 new immigrants, and 44,000 deaths. The total population then rising now to 9.246 million people. Oddly enough, however, one thing the coronavirus apparently had little to no effect on is health. The CBS reporting 83.9% of Israelis aged 20 and up saying their health is very good. While the average life expectancy, already amongst the world's highest, rose slightly to nearly 85 years for women and 81 for men. Okay, just one more Rosh Hashanah story. I promise it's the last one. This one takes us all the way to my hometown of Toronto, Canada. Hi, Mom. <laughs> The Jewish community of downtown Toronto had to be a little bit creative this year with their holiday services because of COVID-19 restrictions, of course, and decided to put on a show for its congregation. This is Shofar Palooza. Take a look at how they celebrated Rosh Hashanah in Toronto and around the world. Toronto Rabbi Elise Goldstein knew the show must go on despite lockdown restrictions put in place. So the city shul congregation celebrated one of the holiest days of the year with festive drive-in services. Shofar Palooza was held in the parking lot of the popular festival venue known as Ontario Place. The service and Rabbi Goldstein's sermon were live streamed for congregants who watched on a big screen from the safety of their cars. This way, attendees were able to socially distance as they participated in the service and watched the blowing of the shofar. That is definitely an interesting way to celebrate the holiday. Well, Israelis are making their mark on TV. A show depicting the life of an ultra-Orthodox community in New York took home an Emmy last night for outstanding directing of a limited series, movie, or dramatic special. The Netflix series called Unorthodox stars Israeli actress Shira Haas and was nominated for six awards in total. The plot follows young Esti as she grapples with her escape from the tight-knit ultra-Orthodox world of Brooklyn moves to Berlin, and discovers herself. Mazal tov to Shira. All right, it's time to take a look at the weather forecast. The weather tonight will be a low of 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius with clear skies. Tomorrow will be 87 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 Celsius, so make sure to stay hydrated. And now, just before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel.
Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of the rain, but that little cutie makes me want to go like puddle jumping or something. I don't know. He's really cute. <laughs> All right. That's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.44 shekels to the American dollar and 2.6 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Lauren Izo. Thank you so much for watching.